Hey y'all, Seth Bradley here. Thank you so much for tuning in and spending your valuable time learning with us. Absolutely appreciate each and every one of you. I've got a small ask. If you'd please just take a few seconds and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening from, it goes a long way in landing the best new guests for our show. That's it. Thanks again. Let's go. All right. Welcome back, Law Nation. You know what time it is. Your favorite time to learn about the world of alternative passive investments so that you can have more freedom, flexibility, and fun. Today, we have Elena Favaro Viana, a modern lawyer, mentor, and entrepreneur. She is the founding and managing partner of EFV Legal, a virtual law firm based in Toronto, Canada, specializing in online business law. She's also the founder of the online boutique, Contracts for Entrepreneurs.com, selling collection of legal contract templates for online entrepreneurs. I love the creativity here. I love that she's venturing into entrepreneurship, thinking outside of the box and getting outside of the traditional legal profession. Her mission is to professionalize the online space and make legal accessible for small business owners. Elena, welcome to the show. This is the Passive Income Attorney Podcast where you'll discover the secrets and strategies of the ultra wealthy on how they build streams of passive income to give them the freedom we all want. Attorney Seth Bradley will help you end the cycle of trading your time for money so you can make money while you sleep. Start living the good life on your own terms. Now, here's your host, Seth Bradley. Elena, what's going on? Welcome to the show. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, excited to have you on. Uh, let's just dive right into your story. Tell us, tell us about yourself. Tell us about your background. Um, how you got here. Take it back as far as you want to. Oh my God, I'm ready. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so actually, I think that I, I have a very unorthodox approach to to how I arrived <laughs> to where I am. So, you know, I'm in Canada and I went to law school in the United Kingdom. So in the UK, I was at the University of Sussex. And then from there, I was really passionate about international law. I really wanted to be an international lawyer. I wanted to, you know, make a difference <laughs> globally. So I ended up getting, um, my first gig was at the United Nations. So I moved to Cambodia and I worked in international criminal law. And then from there, that kind of fed me into the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Uh, and then after a while doing that, I felt this like really strange urge to come home. I was like 28 at the time. And I was still living that backpacker lifestyle. And I don't, I don't know if it's the woman in me, but all of a sudden I wanted like just a clean set of towels. I was really craving <laughs> <laughs> the nesting. <laughs> so I ended up moving back to Toronto. And at that point, you know, I went through the bar exam and articling because we article up here. And, um, and by the time I was done, the entire process of just really getting the license going, I was exhausted. And so I swore I would never, <laughs> I swore I'm like, I am never going to be a lawyer ever again. And I got called to the bar and then sure enough, the way it happened, I'm actually quite a young lawyer. I'm only in my second year, but what ended up happening is of course the world changed, not even six weeks after I got called to the bar. And I remember sitting there being like, oh, which one am I going to do? <laughs> like, I guess I have this, this license that I could use. And I was still in that weird phase where you don't have to fully start paying for your license yet. You know, you're in that weird phase right after getting called to the bar, at least you are here. And so I was like, okay, let's, let's just make a couple hundred bucks doing legal transaction work. Like, you know, whatever I can find uh, until I figure out my next move or until, you know, the big P kind of goes away. Uh, and what ended up happening is in my very first day, I signed two clients. And by the end of that week, I had 10 and this little tiny law firm of mine just grew tremendously since then. Uh, and it'll be two years in April and now I'm a team of eight. So it's, it's gone really well. Wow. That's awesome. That, that's quite yeah. the journey. Um, totally know, unorthodox. I don't think yeah. I've heard anything like that before. <laughs> I mean, studied uh, law in, in the UK and then yeah. Cambodia and a couple other places back to Canada. Pretty wild, pretty wild journey. Totally. Yeah. To uh, really not, not straightforward at all. I really looked at law like a I looked at it, I've always looked at it differently. And so I actually call myself a, a modern lawyer, which I think a lot of lawyers are doing now. They're getting out of the, they're coming out of the gate and they're like, I don't want to do it, the traditional stuff anymore. Like, I think that there needs to be a huge change in the industry. And so, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, what I'm doing. I, awesome. I, I want to go back to something you said when you said, yeah. 
um, you hit that kind of a threshold where you said you didn't want to practice law again. You know, I'm never going to do this again. What, what brought you to that point? So I don't know if it's just Canada because we have to do this 10 month articling between law school and getting called to the bar and doing the bar exams. And it's just a very defeating process. Um, articling is, is essentially a type of employment, but it, it's not regulated by the Employment Act. Uh, and it's effectively free labor for 10 months um, of doing, and everybody knows there's always that guy in the, in, the, in the firm that's doing all the grunt work. And up here, those are the articling students. And by the time you, first of all, it's incredibly competitive. There's not enough positions for the amount of students graduating from law school. So it's, it's almost impossible to get. And then when you get it, it's never quite what you want to be doing. It's never quite where you imagined yourself. And it's always that, you know, it's not like suits on TV. It's in, even though that was filmed in Toronto, <laughs> right? It was filmed in the building across the street, even though, and it's just so defeating. And, and you get to a point where you're like, God, I've been so chewed up by the system. And it takes many years from law school to being an actual lawyer. And then of course I took a few more because I, I, I went international for a while. So I was, I was honestly emotionally done and, um, and my heart was craving creative work. I was really creating that entrepreneur lifestyle that North America had, because at this point I'd moved home from the Netherlands and I hadn't experienced the world of effectively entrepreneurship, small business owners, everybody doing their own thing that North America, you know, Canada and US both have this like spirit of, of greatly, you know, creating your own trail. So I was like, I'm going to do something different. <laughs> yeah. And then, and, and then in the end, <laughs> came back here <laughs> but you kind of you, you blazed your own trail as far as kind of fulfilling that entrepreneurship fire yeah. by starting your own firm and now you've you've grown it tremendously how, how do you think you're able to grow it so quickly and you had you know a lot of success really quickly it sounded like how how do you think what what contributed to that yeah instagram <laughs> instagram <laughs> i like i'm not gonna lie i went where the other lawyers weren't and i went where my clients were i figured i wanted to be one of these entrepreneurs i wanted to be one of these you know online business owners and so i said okay i'm going to help them legally so i'm going to go on instagram and i'm going to act like them and i'm going to do the reels like them and i'm going to talk like them and get to know them uh and it really felt like it really felt like, thank you. It really felt like, thank you for being in this space with all these stay-at-home moms that don't feel like their six-figure business is real. You know, thank you for understanding my little tiny social media management company that's actually making $500,000 a year. And it was really interesting to see the types of clients here that were underrepresented in the legal industry out of fear to going to traditional law and not feeling good enough to have a lawyer on their team. Uh, and so that's the, that's the niche that I fill now. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I, I love that quote that you, you said you went to, went where other lawyers weren't Instagram, yeah. right? Lawyers aren't really on Instagram or you don't think that they are, but that doesn't mean that the people who you want to be your clients aren't yeah. there. They are there. So that's, that's yeah. awesome that you had the, the vision to do that. Thank you. Where your clients are is where you go. I always say, if you want to be a lawyer for tennis players, join the tennis club. <laughs> Like, you know, if you want to be a lawyer for construction workers, go to the construction conference. Like you have to, don't be in a room of lawyers, be in a room of your ideal clients and be the only lawyer in that room. That's the only way to do it. It seems so easy, right? But you know, <laughs> I think, I think most attorneys are like, oh, it's because they're not on there. They're like, oh, I'm not going to go on Instagram or I'm not going to go into a room where I'm the only attorney. I want to be around other attorneys. And oh it, gosh, it's just kind of, no. <laughs> 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 no, find your, find your passion. You know, I even met a lawyer who just specializes in yoga and I was like, you are amazing. And all he does is go to yoga festivals and, and he just does yoga all day and he's doing really well because he understands his clients. And what I find is clients just, they want to be understood. And I think as a corporate lawyer, I don't know if we're going off tangent, but I think as a corporate lawyer, your job is not just to provide legal services. Your job is also to provide business strategy. You have to understand who you're helping and advise them the best. And that's more than just understanding what the statute says. It's about understanding what are the horror stories in your industry that we're going to start plugging into when we're drafting contracts to make sure that doesn't happen to you. Yeah, exactly. And also don't always be the no person. Don't always just be like, no, or this is maybe a little, because there's a little bit of risk here. No, you shouldn't do it. Maybe advise on it. What are the risks? And then yeah. let the business people make their own decision, but don't exactly. always be that, that no, 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 you can't do this. Don't do that. Um, you're not helping the business that way. No, you're not because a business owner, I mean, they're their own CEO. They're their own, they're running their own ship. Like you are advising them like, 
that ship is headed either for land <laughs> or <it is> head- <laughs> heading into that iceberg. Like you decide, I can only do my best. And here's my reporting letter telling you, I advise you otherwise, <laughs> like that's all you can do. Yeah. Um, at what point, uh, you know, during your growing of your practice, your, did you think, I, you know, I want to have another stream of income because I understand that you have um, some, some forms that you sell or tell us yes. about that business. Tell us about how it got started, why you started it and, and then what it is. Oh my gosh. Thank you for asking. So contracts for entrepreneurs.com, my little baby. That was a lot of work, (laughs) but essentially um, what I was finding is the niche that I operate in. And I think this is really important. The niche that I operate in is beginner business owners in the online space. So a lot of them think starting an Instagram business is easy. I just be an influencer and the money comes. So a lot of them don't know that they need to spend money to start a business. Unlike somebody who's going to open a restaurant, for example, they absolutely are anticipating the upfront cost. So the in niche that I was operating in was always shocked at the prices. <laughs> They're always like, mm, no. And so I was finding, okay, how can we create access to justice by eliminating essentially me from the equation to keep costs economical? And so what I did was I created legal contract templates that are industry specific. So they're not jurisdictionally specific, they're industry specific based off of the industries that I primarily work with. And I put them on an e-commerce website for people to sell. And what we did is we just, we drafted them with highlightable fields, a user manual. We're in the process of creating video workbooks for those as well to make it even more easier. Because what I wanted to do was professionalize a space that is unregulated and totally rogue uh, and start bringing accessible options to them with the understanding that this is just at the beginning. This is if you're testing out an offer, but the second that offer is making good money, you need to hire a lawyer. Like the second that offer is proven and you're ready to like, it's done, you've done your due diligence, then it's time to actually customize this and make it specific to you and your business. So this is really just the first step. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. And then when they start making money, those entrepreneurs, then you're the authority. They'll come to you um, when they when they feel like they can afford an attorney. You're the person they're going to come to. That is the that either <laughs> me or somebody else. I mean, I'm sure. just happy if people are taking legal action. And I always say that because I do say, I mean, the shop is independent of me as a person, independent of me um, of, of legal advice. So I really do my best to create that kind of Chinese wall. However. It, I do the marketing on Instagram and a lot of people associate it as part of my personal brand, if you will. Uh, And so they do, I do get a lot of questions. And so always trying to navigate that space has been interesting. And I do find there's a lot of, you know, retention of customers because they're dipping their toes in both pools. They hire me at the firm and then they're like, you know what? I don't think I want a full custom contract from you, Elena. I'll just grab one off the shop, test out this idea and then come back to you in six months. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you, you built that bridge. So at least, you know, yeah. if they're, because if they, you, you put a big price tag on your services and someone's just like, no, I, I just don't have the money for it. Or they don't think they can afford it. And then yeah. they just go and do it without any kind of legal protection that puts them in a really bad spot. So at well, least you built that bridge so that they have some protection and a nice, um, you know, a, a nice base form to, to start with until they, they believe that they can afford, um, you know, a custom contract. Yeah, because I always say I'm like, legal is not a luxury. It's a necessity, plain and simple. It's a necessity. So how can we make it more accessible to you uh, in order for you to just at least get a little bit, like at least get a little bit of protection until you're comfortable and you're ready and you've, you know, worked through your own mindset issues to feel like you can actually build this thing. And then I'm here for you. Yeah. Now, when you say it's industry specific, do you mean yeah. for influencers um, selling information like that sort of that sort of folks or what do you mean by by industry specific? So industry specific. So I really focus it on the niches that I work with. So I work a lot with coaches. I work a lot with um, virtual assistants, service providers, graphic media designers, photographers. So we've created contracts for those types of people and we're constantly growing it whatever new niche is coming through the door. And what we're trying to do is whenever we get a new contract and a new template that we're working on, we do our best at the same time as drafting it for the client to draft a templated version for our firm, but also to create a version of it for the shop. And once we feel like we've really done and dusted it and it's, it's quite neutral, it's not super specific to one person, but for this industry, then we, we create a user manual and we throw it on the shop to be sold. That's brilliant. I love it. That's, that's the entrepreneurship coming out right there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, they say lawyers can't be entrepreneurs, but we're going to prove them wrong. <laughs> that's right. That's right. 
Um, so you had mentioned coaches and you also are a coach as well, right? Correct. Yeah. Tell Correct. us a little bit about that business. I, I've had a couple of attorneys that were coached. They all take kind of different niches. You know, some of them um, coach other attorneys, some of them coach uh, investors, some of them coach different people. What What's kind of your, your, your spin on that? I mean, I love it. So, I mean, it's really interesting. I'm mentoring a lot of other lawyers right now and, <laughs> and a lot of online business owners that are trying to start grow and scale their online business or brick and mortar to pivot to the online space. I find that I'm, I'm deeply passionate and I have a little bit of a knack <laughs> for Instagram marketing and, and being in that space. And so we, I do a lot of mentorship to help people actually build and stay sustainable online as well. Since I've been able to do it not once or twice, but three times with three different business models. So I think it allows me to spend more time with a client outside of the legal, you know, legal services uh, and branch out into different areas of their business that they need more strategic help on. Attorneys, doctors, passive income seekers, I'm talking to you. I remember investing in my first passive real estate deal, the anxiety, the uncertainty of what I didn't know and what I had never done before. It was a lot of money being wired to someone I barely knew. Now, it all worked out, but that's not always the case. I would have never invested in that same deal today now that I have the knowledge and the confidence to know how to invest intelligently. And now with a combination of uncertainty and a flood of newbie sponsors in the market, how do you find the true experts that will perform and make your investment successful? For those of you out there looking to learn how to invest passively in syndications, we've been behind the scenes working on something very special. You don't have time to go through a six month course or to try to make a program designed for deal sponsors work for you. You wanna be a passive investor, focus on your career and your family, but add cash flowing, appreciating commercial real estate investments to your portfolio. So you can practice when you want to and not because you have to. We've built a powerful passive investor program designed to teach you everything you need to know, but nothing that you don't. It's a four week program, but if you really wanna make moves, it can be completed in just a few days with ongoing support as you make your investment decisions. Passive Income Pro is enrolling now with a very limited number of seats for each cohort, so you can get the hands-on attention that you need. Go to PassiveIncomePro.io to learn more. Yeah, what, what are some of the things, what are some of the good things you're seeing from your coaching clients once they've kind of, you know, taken your advice and, and, and kind of gotten a taste of success? You know, how have you, how have you seen their lives kind of change for the better? Oh my God. They're like, <laughs> some of them are amazing. One of them, she was amazing. She came to me. She's like, Elena, she's like, I don't know what I want to do, but I want an online business. I'm like, okay. <laughs> six months later, that girl made her first six figures. She moved her life to Tulum. She's living her best life nomadically. Now <laughs> she's building out an entire course. And I'm just like, okay. So I think it's just, it's about getting over the hurdle uh, and the fear of starting an online business. And I do think as a mentor, you have the credibility of being a lawyer behind it as well. So you're not just you have something behind, like you have some accreditation to what you're teaching uh, and you have the inside look at so many different business models through the firm that are coming constantly through the door. So when you're actually spending, you know, six months to a year with somebody, you're able to apply multiple different strategies to them and be like, this is what you need. So, you know, the majority of my clients are all averaging about $30,000 a month right now after working together for anywhere between six months to a year. And so they're all doing really well. And now we're all trying to scale to that million dollar mark for them. Wow. That's, that's incredible. Those are some incredible numbers. I think I need to hire you. <laughs> <laughs> I work with podcasters too, Seth. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. Yeah. And I think uh, it, it's interesting because I think attorneys and they don't realize it, that they can be really good teachers. They can be really good coaches. Um, you know, we're trained to think like attorneys and, and just kind of having that analytical nature and, and being trained uh, again, to think like a, an attorney gives us a, a, an advantage um, over, over some other folks that maybe don't have that credibility or haven't been trained in that way. I completely agree. I mean, I have to admit that the huge difference, I think, between, you know, Canadian lawyers and, and U.S. lawyers, especially in New York, I'm so jealous of them, is, you know, we don't even see, especially up here, like, we don't even see a contract in law school. Like, we don't learn any of these things, how to actually be a lawyer, the practical side of it. But what we learn is how that spidey feeling, you know, that feeling in your gut where you're just like, that doesn't look right. And then it's like, why doesn't it look right? And then you know how to find the answer. And I think that's what lawyers really are good at is just knowing how to figure it out. And I know that's a really simplifying way of putting it, but unlike other 
unlike other, you know, entrepreneurs and industries, I think lawyers really know how to have that feeling that something is off. I don't know why, but I can tell something is off because the training and find the correct answer for it. And I think that's why they call it practicing law as well, because the more you find those spidey senses, the more your own repertoire of knowledge is growing and you're just like, wow, great. We're going to add that in. It becomes second language to you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you're right. When, when you start reading something or somebody's telling you a story, or maybe you're reading a contract, you, you just kind of get that feeling. What's well, there's maybe, maybe they're not telling me the whole story or maybe yes. that, that something's not quite right. Or with the contract, you're like, what's missing here. There, there should be something else in here that, that we need some extra protection on. And it, it's interesting. I, it, I think that does come from the training that we've gotten. I agree. I agree. I think it's really <sighs> law school. <laughs> law school <laughs> is its own conversation. <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you talk to a lot of uh, folks that are in law school or considering law school? I, I find myself getting uh, reached out to folks like that because I sometimes I'll preach like, ah, maybe think about if you want to go into law or not, give it a, give it a second thought. I don't discourage people from it, but yeah. a lot of folks do end up reaching out to me and say, oh, well, wh wh do you, why do you think that? But I, I'm just wondering if people reach out to you like that. So yes and no. So I'm finding, I mean, what we, what I'm trying to do. So like I said, I had to go through an articling uh, and I was never mentored. I actually had a terrible, I had a terrible time. And so I'm very passionate about mentoring anybody that wants to learn from me. I recognize, I mean, I'm only a two-year lawyer. So that my, what I can teach is also limited. I, you know, I don't pretend to be more naive than I am, but we started a summer internship program last year. So we had two legal students from my old university who came in and um, we already have three applications for this summer. So I think it's naturally going on its own path. Um, and, and I try to work with students who are going through the process as well, because I'm deeply passionate about being, being like, this is what I figured out. This is what I learned in my practice. And let me show you. And what I'm hearing from them is, well, we do a lot of contracts. They're like, wow, I've never seen a contract before. Like, this is really interesting work. And I'm like, exactly. And, <laughs> and these are what the, the clauses mean and why you should be using may and shall versus can and will or whatever the situation is. And these little tiny nuances that you don't, no one... It's so interesting that we're not taught these things, um, but it really takes time practicing and doing it. And I have to admit, like going out on my own two months after being called to the bar is very unusual. So figuring it out on my own has been like the amount of growth, Seth, that this firm has required of me has been exponential in the last two years. <laughs> Right. It's like sink or swim, right? You, you've got to learn. You've got to know what you're doing. You, you've got to kind of scale it quickly um, or you won't make it. And, and yeah. you, I mean, you have, but it, it, I, I always wondered, you know, some of the folks that, you know, just graduated from law school and then they just start their own firm right out. I was like, what in the world? How? <laughs> I have no clue what I'm doing. How, how, how are you doing that? Uh, but you just learn. You, and you I can learn. see where you just exponentially learn a lot quicker if you're just kind of forced into it, right? A hundred percent when you eliminate, and I teach this to my mentorship clients too. It's like when you eliminate the crutches, when you eliminate the safety nets, that is the only time that you're ever successful. And I see this too, when I work with people who sell their nine to five and are trying to grow a business until they they quit their nine to five or get fired, or get fired until <laughs> that moment, they never grow because that crutch is really strong and they have that safety net. And, and it's really interesting. You just have to get rid of it somehow and take the biggest leap really. Yeah. Yeah. That I think, you know, sometimes people there, there'll be unfortunately an unfortunate event or something that, that occurs. And that's that big push that yeah. pushes somebody over the edge and they're like, okay, well now I'm, I'm out on a ledge. I'm going to do it. Um, and, and it, it's good to coach people into taking action without having that unfortunate event happening. Um, getting fired or, or losing a loved one or something like that. Where oh, you, yeah. you, you have that light switch. Hopefully oh, breakups are big breakups, yeah, breakups too. Oh yeah, my God. They're huge. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting. You, you really do need that, but you can, you can honestly facilitate that yourself without the tragedy. Like you can create a faux environment that's, that propels you into success as well. <laughs> so you don't have to wait until yeah. something bad happens to you. Yeah. I think that's one of the beautiful parts of, of coaching or masterminds, uh, things like that, where you're, you have that accountability and someone just kind of in your ear and, and coaching you and, and talking to you to say, Hey, well, maybe you should do this because you kind of, if you don't have that, you're just, you're comfortable, right? Yeah. You're, you're just comfortable in, in what you're doing. And especially for a lot of our listeners and, and like you and I that are attorneys, 
we, we could have a good job where we're just a nine to five. Well, probably more than a nine to five, but you know, like, we'll, we'll call it a nine to five. <laughs> oh, we'll go five to five or five to eight. You know, I was, yesterday I saw work five to at nine, like backwards. literally yesterday I stopped working at four forty five, and I was like, this is a half day. I'm taking a half day today. <laughs> it was so weird. But yeah, no, you have to work hard. I, I that's you know, you have to work hard. You do. Yeah, yeah. So again, you know, the masterminds, the coaching, it can kind of get you over the edge and give you that accountability where 100%. you don't need, you know, some sort of a, a crazy emotional event to, to push you over the edge for you to, yeah. for you to take that action. Um, I, I kind of want to switch gears a little bit to get your opinion on this because um, you have coaching clients and, and I do too. And it's like, you know, we're really highly paid as, as attorneys and, you know, just like doctors and dentists, uh, a lot of times you just hear about people being unhappy. Right. Why, uh, why do you yeah. think that is? I, I know you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, having wanting to reform the legal profession and the modern lawyer. You know, what, what do you think makes attorneys and even doctors and dentists and folks like that that have really good jobs, make really good money, um, unhappy? I think it's, it's you know, there's so many answers. Sorry about that. There are so many answers, um, so many answers. And and, you know, one of them, I think that the, the legal profession is designed uh, to be stressful. I, I think it's very complicated to work in the legal profession and have it stress-free. Uh, only luckily if you work in some in-house capacities, but even then I think it's, it's truly designed to be stressful. And then the second thing is lawyers are a bunch of overachievers, unfortunately. And so what we do is we actually attribute our worth to our output. And we believe that our value is, is based off of how much money we make, how many billable hours we did, how much many clients we got, how many hours we worked. And you know, you see this at big law firms as well. It's like the, the guys that are 67 years old, they're putting in more hours than the young guys. And so it's really this, this sense of innate value that is, for lack of a better word, messed up with lawyers. <laughs> um, and I don't know why that is. And I think it is a very competitive industry so, so I think the two combined is that you're constantly forced to work because the profession requires it, but also you don't know how to not do that because you feel like you're not worthy if you're not working. That's my opinion. Yeah, no, I love it. It's nature and nurture, right? Like the people yeah. that are attracted to it are those high achievers. So they, they need to put a value on, they need to achieve it with numbers. Maybe that's billing yeah. 0.6. So that's part of the, the nature part or the, the nurture part because- you know, our profession is set up. So we're trading time for money every yep. six minutes, which is insane. That's like That's kind of lot. the, yeah. <laughs> I did not know that statistic. That's terrifying. We're not even talking about hours. We're talking about, you know, six minutes. So it's, it's insane. So it's just kind of set up for, for failure. And we need to, we need to kind of change the, the atmosphere around that so that we can, we can try to fix yeah, that. Because also the legal profession has a glass ceiling. Like, yes, lawyers can make a lot of money, do all lawyers make a lot of money? No, there is a glass ceiling. There's only so much you can charge for certain legal services. Whereas I look at the coaching world, for example, not that I charge this, but there's coaches out there charging $50,000, $60,000 without any you know, accreditation, without law school loans, without spending 11 years of their life studying. you know. And so I think there is a glass ceiling to law as well. And we constantly look at, okay, well, we should be making that much money. So we have to work harder to attain this goal that we've, or expectation we put in our mind. Um, and I think truly, I mean, for anybody who's listening to this that wants to go to law school or is thinking about this as their path, like, because they want to be rich, this is not the way to do it. This is not the easier way to do it. Like you actually have to enjoy this and more than enjoying the area of law you go into, you have to enjoy who you're helping, who's on the other side of the desk, right? I mean, so it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting conversation because I, I look at some of the businesses that I work with that come to the firm and I'm like, how much did you make last year? And you did nothing. <laughs> like, it's crazy. And, you know, we live in a really interesting world where you can make a lot of money doing a lot of nothing as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Before we jump into the Sorry. Four four, oh, no. You're <laughs> I get it. I get, I get passionate. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I love it. I, I can hear the passion. Um, before we jump into the freedom for one last gold nugget for our listeners. Oh, you put me on the spot. I got nothing right now. <laughs> I got nothing right now. No, I think, you know, the most, the most important thing I kind of already alluded to it, especially when it comes to law is it's never too late to change practices. It's not right. I'll be 100% transparent. Like, you know, I failed the bar exam once. 
does not define my success. I never took a business corporate law class in law school. I am a corporate lawyer now. Like, you know, you don't need to do things one way. You will inevitably get there. There isn't anybody that doesn't ever achieve the goal. You always will. But I have to say that you have to be incredibly disciplined and you really have to understand why you want to be doing this. Um, and, and more than that, who you want to help. Because before I used to be in criminal law, like I mentioned, and that was like reading a murder mystery novel every single day. <laughs> every time I read those witness statements, I was like, and they did what? Like, it was so interesting. But the client on the other side of the table was not somebody that I could associate with. It wasn't somebody that I, I didn't have, I clearly didn't have much in common with. Um, and I found it very difficult for me to do that work. Whereas now I'm doing arguably much more boring work, right? Nobody likes corporate law, <laughs> but the people on the other side of the table are so freaking inspiring and so interesting. And who I get to hang out with now, literally on all my meetings are, I am so excited for my day because who I get to talk to. And I think I'm also a little bit of an extrovert, so that helps, but I think it's so much more about who's on who's across the table from you versus what you're doing. So don't, you know, don't choose according to money or work, choose according to who you get to spend your time with. Yeah, I agree. I mean, <laughs> I can tell that you love working with these, you know, these entrepreneurs yeah. um, in their businesses. And I do something similar. I work with a lot of people in real estate because I love real oh, estate. I'm, I'm passionate I about real estate. I love real estate. Yeah. It's another so, conversation. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I, when I'm doing real estate work at a big law firm, like I used to, kind of miserable, but I, even though I love real estate doing real estate law, you know, as it's very intricate, it's very time consuming, it's very stressful. And then clerical it, too. It, yeah. yeah. And then doing it for myself when I'm putting a deal together, when it's my deal and I'm doing the legal work for these guys that are on my team, totally different because it's the people so that you surround different. yourself with and who you're yeah. working with and for that make all the difference. It's a smile at the end or the thank you so much. Couldn't have done this without you. Or like, Oh my God, like, or like whatever that little, it's like, it's so rare, but they really, they fuel your tank. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's jump into the freedom Four. it's time for the freedom Four. what's the best thing you do to keep your mind and body healthy. Okay, this is really funny, but I do, I do a lot of Tai Chi. Oh, so yeah. I do. <laughs> I do. So embarrassing. I haven't said it out loud. However, I do do a lot of Tai Chi. Um, it, and I find that it's a very, it's a good way to move the energy through my body. I, quite, I have very frantic energy and I feel, and so Tai Chi really helps me to just, it's so low impact, but that just breathing and the gentle movements, that's what I do. And it's, changes my life. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. With all your success, what is one limiting belief that you've crushed along the way and how did you get past it? Ugh, money, 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 money. Money was hard. Money was next level. Oh, money. I, you know, <laughs> I can't, I can't, it's, it's a beast. It's a truly a beast to, to, to accept money, to feel deserving of money, to feel worthy of money, to attract money into your life, to understand that they're is no capacity to money. You can make as much or as little as, as you vibrate. The choice is yours. Um, I remember when I started, I was like, I told my mentor at the time, I'm like, gosh, my life would change if I made like $6,000 in three months. And he laughed at me, Seth. He laughed so hard. And at the time I was like, I was very offended. I was like, <laughs> like, that's hard for me. <laughs> and, you know, and then in the end, like I told you, like I got two clients on that first day. So I surpassed that goal on my first day. And then he laughed. He's like, I told you. And I was, it's a construct. So once I started to understand the frequency of money, and it sounds really wishy-washy, but the energetics behind it and that it's always coming and that I, I never have to be desperate for a client because I do good work. You know, my energy is out there selling before I sell and it's out there having conversations before I ever even enter a room. Uh, money's coming. So money work was is, is still a huge practice of my, of my life. That's a great answer. It's, it's that <laughs> abundance mindset, right? Yeah. It, that abundance mindset, like, oh, I'm not going to save a few pennies because I don't know if I'm going to make this next, you know, I'm not going to get my next paycheck or next client or whatever it is. Yeah. You, it's you limiting. Have, it's yeah. so limiting. Yeah. And yeah. if you just, yeah, you have to operate and you also have to, I mean, if I might, there's something that I learned. It's so, it's very woo woo. I don't know if your listeners are into this, but there's something called a CSO. So above your C-suite, above your executives, your CEO, there's something called the chief spiritual officer. I don't know if you've ever heard of this concept and it's essentially where you as the you know the pseudo ceo the boss you're like listen 
I need to make another $2,000 this month. CSO, I'm delegating to you. And you just, you intentionally delegate to your chief spiritual officer to go find it for you. And every time I've done this, it sounds weird, I can't believe I'm saying it, but every time I've done it, it's worked. It's worked. I either forgot about an invoice that I didn't send and boom, there was the money I asked for, or I got a new client that hit the exact amount that I was asking for. And so then you're like, oh, I'd like a little bit more. <laughs> so um, so it's really about learning how to delegate those energetics as well as, as embodying them too. Yeah. I, I love that. I mean, it's just like <laughs> speaking it into existence. It's yeah. you know, when they tell you to you know do visualizations and affirmations and all that kind of stuff. It's yeah. all about like, just kind of to me, it's like kind of like goal setting. You're kind of putting it out there. It like is. this is what's going to happen. And then y- your mind kind of makes that leap and makes it happen. Whatever those uh, yeah. tangible actions are, you can take um, in real life. You'll just do it because you you've already seen the end goal and what you expect, whether that's $2,000 right? in the next week or some big goal at the end of the year, whatever you've it already, is. Right. Yeah, you'll, you'll, I mean, you'll Yogi, fill in Bear, <laughs> Yogi Bear always said, he's like, how are you going to get there if you don't know where you're going? <laughs> And so you yeah, think like Yogi Bear and, and yeah, voice it into existence. So you will make it, you will get there. Yeah. Yeah. What's one actionable step our listeners can do right now to start creating more freedom. Oh, take action. Just do the damn thing. Ready is a lie. Perfection is the biggest procrastination ever. No, you do not need a website to be successful. Just get out there and tell people what you do and sell. And don't be afraid to be annoying because by the time that you feel obnoxious and annoying, you're just getting through to somebody. And especially if you're in a profession like law, like, people need you. It's, it's so it's the marketing is done for you. You don't have like, we are so spoiled as lawyers when we make sales. I'm not kidding you. When a client comes through the door, it is so easy to land that client unless you seriously mess it up. But so you just have to get out there and just take action. Just, just take action and stop waiting. Love it. Love it. doesn't (laughs) have to be perfect. Just do it. No. Yeah. (laughs) And last but not least, how has passive income made your life better? Oh my God. It's magical. (laughs) (laughs) it's so magical it's so magical because you know I mean I will admit it's only returning the shop itself is turning one year in March right so at the time of this recording we're we're, we're coming up to that and I'm so excited for what it's done in the one year it it hasn't hit like the million you know we're not we're not there yet (laughs) one day but what it is it's so beautiful to just know that my groceries for the month are taken care of like I don't have to work that day like if I'm ill like this is working for me um it doesn't, it isn't one of those things where you just put it up and you're going to magically sell. There is work behind it. The difference between passive income and active income is the selling is always there. You have to sell passive. You have to sell active. Active though, is once you've sold, then you have to do the work. That's law practices. Passive is once you've sold end of transaction, move on. So you really have to be love selling. Um, and, but it, and I love to sell, <laughs> but it, it's, it's really nice. It's really nice to just kind of be like, give that little notification where you're like, hmm, I just woke up from a nap and there's $400. Like, it's a really good feeling. And, and it allows you to also, you know, tell my CSO and I'm like, listen, I'm going to take a nap today. You go do your work. And then you wake up and there's a freaking, you know, payment notification. It's really nice. <laughs> yeah. That's all. Awesome. I don't, <laughs> I don't ever- know. <laughs> No, yeah. you nailed it. I don't think I've ever heard anyone explain it that way. Passive versus active with the sale component. Like it's a sale yeah. up front versus the sale and then the work or, or what have you. Yeah. you ha- Passive is work too. People yeah. really misconstrue that. I mean, I get this all the time. People are like, oh, I want passive income. I'm going to put a course up and be a millionaire overnight. And I'm like, who's buying this? Like who, like who, like, tell me who's buying this thing. Like you have to do the work to get the volume through the door. Um, and you have to do the work through the messaging to once they're in the door to be sold while they're there, you have to do the email sequences at the end to make sure that they circle back to your passive product. You have to solidify that answer with at least a hundred thousand dollars before generating ads to it. Because if you can't sell it organically, you'll never sell it with ads. Um, so there's a huge, there's a lot of work that goes into it, but at the same time, once you've made the sale, you're done. Right. And that's the best part. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Elena, this has been awesome. This has been a really <laughs> unique and incredible show. Where can our listeners find out more about you? Yeah, come visit me. So of course, come visit me on Instagram. <laughs> My Instagram is at where did she go now? Um, and you can check out the shop as well at contractsforentrepreneurs.com. There's a little link about me there that'll lead you to my law firm website if you're curious, but come say hi. And if you have any questions, I'd love to help you out in any way. Sounds good. Thanks, Elena. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. This was so much fun, Seth. Elena, thank you so much again for coming on the show. 
I simply love your creative approach to the legal profession and how you've been able to think outside of the box to create a passive income stream for yourself rather than simply trading a billable hour for money. It's awesome to see your success and how you've been able to leverage your legal skills into something other than the traditional billable hour. All right, folks, if you're ready to take the next step in your investing journey and you've been interested in investing in real estate but not sure where to get started, I can show you the way. I can show you how to invest passively, where to find great deals, where to find great sponsors, and teach you, even if you don't know, what a syndication is. It's called Passive Income Pro. It's a four-week program guaranteed to give you the knowledge and the confidence that you need to invest in your first or your next passive real estate deal. Go to PassiveIncomePro.io to get started. All right, folks, as always, see you next time. Enjoy the journey. Thank you for listening to the Passive Income Attorney Podcast with Seth Bradley. Do you want more ideas on how to generate multiple streams of passive income? Then jump over to PassiveIncomeAttorney.com for show notes and resources. Then apply for the private Facebook community by searching for the Passive Income Attorney on Facebook. And we'll see you on the next episode.